Chapter 9 is focused on presentation aids, and so we're going to jump right into this today. Visuals are, are very powerful tools for informing and persuading. Uh, most people have grown up with television, and we're kind of just conditioned to learn by means of imagery. Uh, visual aids are considered a vital part of most business uh, and professional presentations today. The attitude throughout society is, though, don't just tell me, show me. Show me what you got. And so we're going to take a look at what it means to include presentation aids in your public speeches. And this is going to help you out as you prepare for your first speech. There's a lot of advantages for um, using visual aids. And this PowerPoint slide was used by a student before in a speech on endangered butterflies. Uh, it illustrates a lot of things about how a visual aid can enrich and enliven a, a speech. Uh, and here are some of the advantages of using these visual aids. They can make ideas clear and understandable. Uh, they can also make a speech more interesting. Sometimes you're going to have a, a dry topic, but visual aids can help you out and make it more interesting. They can help an audience member remember facts and details after the speech is over. Sometimes they can make long, complicated explanations absolutely unnecessary because the picture and the image uh, tells the listener exactly what you're trying to communicate. They can also help um, prove a point, and they can add to your credibility. Uh, and all these things are just going to help you become a better public speaker. Uh, if you have listeners who speak English as a second language, a lot of times visual aids can enhance that communication to them whereas the language may not communicate, the visual absolutely could. There are different types of visual aids, and so we're going to go through some of these. Some of these you're going to use this semester. Some of them you may not use, but you'll need them in the future. The first type of visual aid that we're going to look at is called a line graph, and, and you've seen these before. A line graph uses a horizontal and a vertical scale to show trends and the relationship between two different variables. And as you can see on this line graph here, um, this is a graph all about where people prefer to watch movies for the first time. In the year 2000, theaters were actually the preferred place to go watch a brand new movie. But as the years have progressed and technology has uh, continued through DVD and Blu-ray and now uh, streaming online, <clears throat> most people prefer to watch the movie for a first time at their home. So that is definitely a flip-flop, and you can show uh, through a line graph this correlation of ideas. You've also got bar graphs. Uh, this bar graph uh, is telling about how many days of paid vacation that people uh, are take and are, are afforded in different countries. You can see in the United States alone, we usually get about 13 days of paid vacation. That's pretty much standard, a couple of weeks per job. But look at Brazil. Brazil gives 34 paid vacation days. And, and I don't know about you, but I would like to move to Italy. 42 days of paid vacation. That's pretty incredible. So you can represent this information in bar graphs. Then you've got your famous pie graph. Uh, pie graph is basically a circle that is going to represent a hundred percent of something. And then that circle is divided into segments of various sizes. Uh, this pie graph is going to uh, demonstrate or, or basically it dramatizes the staggering number of people who died when the Titanic sank. Um, I never realized that 1,500 people died, but what's even more surprising to me is I didn't know 705 people survived. In my mind, I thought that there was just a handful of survivors, but basically a third of the, the passengers actually survived the sinking of the Titanic. And the pie graphs are useful for this kind of information. There's also pictorial graphs, and you can take some statistical information, and basically you visually translate it into a picture that can be grasped uh, instantly by whoever's looking at it. Uh, this graph is based on a survey about whether people finish reading the books that they actually select. You know, you, you pull a book off the shelf and you read the first couple of chapters. You mean to come back to it, but you don't. Well, this survey found that out of every four books that people start reading, only one is actually read all the way to the end. That's kind of sad. This is an information chart, and this is also called uh, something called a a list of key ideas. Uh, this information chart can be presented on PowerPoint slides or you can make a poster out of it or some transparencies for an overhead projector. If possible, only prevent one, present one item at a time though. Um, you don't want to uh, overwhelm 
the listener and get their uh, you know their mind on something else before it's time. So you can see is when you invite a dinner guest, number one, ask about food preferences. Do they have any food allergies and then any special dietary needs? Uh, you can use informational charts for these things. Uh, you can also use drawings, such as this map here. Um, this map can help an audience remember some really cool key ideas. And this map is unique, and, and maybe this will blow your mind. But this map shows that half of all Americans, I get it, half, 50% of everyone in the United States, live in just nine states. So half of the United States population lives in California, Texas, Georgia, Florida, Illinois, Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, New York. Uh, when I first saw this, this was amazing to me. Uh, that means we have 41 other states where half of the country lives. And so you can show these kind of things with drawings and really draw in your audience. You can also use photos. Photos can be very powerful uh, visual aids. This photo of the Earth was taken from uh, outer space by an American astronaut, and it's just beautiful. Uh, this is a real photo. This wasn't doctored, and uh, so this is really kind of a cool way to use a visual aid. Just use a photo. Now, you can use video and animations and because they're really effective visuals. I remember a student gave a speech on deep sea diving, and it was really neat to see how he incorporated uh, this video of a person who was, who was deep sea diving and free diving and didn't have any uh, scuba gear on, nothing, just fins, a uh, mask, and a snorkel. And this person was diving down and showed a brief video of it. And what was really neat, after the video was gone for 10 or 15 seconds, he revealed that that was actually him in the video, and he lives in Florida. And that's what he would do in his spare time. He loved to free dive. And so you can definitely use videos or a series of photos to show uh, steps on how to do something. Maybe it's an informational speech about food preparation. You can use any of that kind of stuff to help you visually communicate what you're trying to get across to your audience. You can also use objects and models. And sometimes these things are useful. An hourglass would be a really cool uh, object to use if you're going to talk about how ancient people marked the passage of time, you can actually bring one in and show the audience what an hourglass really looks like. Um, you can also use yourself and, and maybe even volunteers. But here's what I want to caution you. If you use volunteers, most of the time it's easier if you kind of pre-set it up, maybe a couple minutes before the speech. You talk to them, let them know what you're expecting. Um, but you can use yourself. You can use volunteers. Um this particular student actually uh, did a presentation on what it means to be a mime at parties. And so she shows up and she's wearing her costume and a makeup. And in her speech, she stops and actually demonstrates some of her routine, which is really cool. But uh, just be careful uh, if you're going to be using volunteers. Um, sometimes that can backfire on you. I remember a speech that was given by a student who was going to try to demonstrate a particular dance move, and she called volunteers up, and they were not um, outgoing. And so it was kind of uh, a bad visual aid to use when these people refused to do the dance. It didn't work out well for that student, but you want to make sure that you use the correct ones or use yourself. PowerPoint slides. You're going to use a lot of PowerPoint. And one student actually made this particular um, slide for PowerPoint that shows that one ice cream cone has the same amount of fat grams as four frozen yogurt cones, which is pretty cool. I mean, you get to eat four yogurt cones and uh, you will equal the same fat and, and ice cream. Now, don't run out and eat four yogurt cones, but um, that is a very good representation of what the student was trying to get across. Uh, again, uh, there are so many things that you can do with video in PowerPoint, but here's one thing I want you to understand. You have to test your PowerPoint presentation if you choose to include video. So many times a student will come to class or a student will put together a PowerPoint and the, the video is saved on their computer at their dorm room or at home, and they'll say, well, it worked at home. Well, the problem is, is the way that PowerPoint links videos, if that video is not natively on your hard drive or on your thumb drive where you've actually created the PowerPoint, when you attempt to display that video, it can't find it. 
And so PowerPoint has progressed uh, a lot. You can link YouTube videos, especially if you're like you're in a classroom or you're at home uh, or in your dorm where you have internet access and a YouTube video can play. You can do that. But if you're going to be linking a saved file that is local, you have to make sure that you copy that video file into the folder, like if you're going to put it onto a thumb drive, because if you don't, uh, PowerPoint's going to be looking for a video that's not there. And if you haven't tried it, it is quite unnerving when you're in the middle of a speech and you plan to show a short video. The video does not work. Uh, we've all seen it happen before, so just be prepared as far as videos are concerned. If you have any questions, you can go online and see how to do that correctly. You can run by my office. Uh, just let me know how I can help you if you ever need that. Uh, you can use multimedia from the internet because you know on the internet you can find photos, you can find drawings, maps, charts, videos, you name it, audio clips. There's tons of stuff out there on the internet. But here's the question as we get into integrity issues here. Uh, is it legal to download these items without getting permission first? I mean, can you just go willy-nilly onto the Internet, and if you see a picture, copy and paste it into your presentation? Is that even legal? Well, that's kind of a catch-22, because for classroom speeches, yeah, you can take anything you see off the Internet. Uh, copyright restrictions do not apply because you're engaged in a non-commercial, educational, one-time use of materials. So you're cool. So if you find something you want to present in PowerPoint form and during this class, during your speeches, you are totally able to do that. A lot of businesses, though, in professional presentations, when you get into the real world, you can't just go pick out what you want. You have to get permission. And some places will actually ask you to pay a royalty to use their their images or their videos or their information. So be careful. But as far as the classroom is concerned, you're totally cool. You're covered under the educational acts and stuff, so you're fine. There are different types of visual aids that we've just discussed, and they can be conveyed to the audience by a variety of media. And so we're going to take a look of what it takes to actually get these visual aids out to your audience. The first is going to be multimedia projectors and televisions. Now, if you were in my classroom, we have a television on the wall with HDMI capabilities. We also have an Apple TV that you can sync uh, an iPad or an iPhone up to. It's no problem. But if you're taking this course online, well, you're going to have to find a way, if you choose to use PowerPoint, to display to a television or a projector in your in your your chosen place to give your speech. Um, but in, in the real world, most places will have a projector or a large screen TV, and you can plug in and you can show your PowerPoint slides, you can show your videos or what have you. Uh, you also have the option of using presentation boards, and these are whiteboards or chalkboards. Um, these are great tools for visual aids if you have like a complex drawing that's going to require a lot of insertions or erasures. Um, for example, if you're kind of diagramming plays for a soccer team or something like that. Uh, but both kind of have their drawbacks too. Uh, in order to successfully use whiteboards and blackboards, you have to turn your back to the audience. And that is so not advised because remember, it's all about eye contact. So you have to kind of perfect this method of looking at the audience while you're writing or drawing at the same time. Um, another thing is, is, if you've ever seen chalk, uh, remember back in grade school or high school, if you had chalkboards in your classrooms, perhaps sometimes that chalk dust will get on uh, you, the teacher. Remember the teacher who had the chalk on her nose or on her pants leg or his shirt? Uh, you have to be careful when it comes to those things. So be careful with those, but they are very, very useful. You can also use posters. Uh, these can be like this gentleman here, a handheld poster, or you can put it on an easel. Uh, the speaker is going to use the poster to refute common myths here about chocolate. Uh, and he asks, does chocolate cause acne? Is chocolate addictive? Is chocolate loaded with caffeine? Now, these are all great questions. What do you think? What do you think the answer to these are? I'll give you a second to think about it. Okay, the answer to all three of these questions is no. Uh, chocolate doesn't cause acne. It's not addictive, and it is not actually not loaded with caffeine. I kind of had the first two, but I didn't realize about the last one. But chocolate is not, does not contain a ton of caffeine. It has some, but not a lot. Then you can use these big old things called flip charts. It's a giant writing pad whose pages are glued or kind of wired together at the top. You can put it on an easel. Uh, when you're through with each page, you can either tear it off or you can flip it over. 
Uh, this is pretty cool. So just be careful if you're using these again, not to turn your back to the audience. And it would be better to go ahead and prepare your visuals on these things before you speak. So yeah, flip charts are totally useful. Handouts are great too. This is actually a handout for um, a thing called a fixie bike. Uh, this was a, a fad a couple years back ago. Uh, fixie bikes uh, have only one gear. They have no brakes. They can't coast or anything like that. But uh, fixie bikes are really cool. They're more for like city use. Uh, handouts are really popular as visual aids because they're easy to make, right? We can all just type one up real quick. It, at the last minute, if you need to update it, that can be done quickly. Uh, this gives the listeners a permanent document for uh, bringing information home with them after they leave your presentation. You want to make sure not to make the handout lengthy or complex. And, and number two, you don't want to pass it out during a speech because if you pass a handout during a speech, the listeners are going to be studying the handout instead of listening to what you have to say. So here's my suggestion. Distribute your handout after the question and answer period. If you have one of those during your speeches, um, give it to the audience afterward. Uh, that way they will not be distracted by it. Uh, this machine here is called an Elmo. You see these a lot in high school or college or junior high, elementary. Uh, this is basically a document camera. Uh, Elmo is actually the slang term. Elmo is the company that creates them. Um, but anyway, it's a camera that's mounted on a stand and it's pointed at the platform below. And anything you put underneath the camera shows up on a TV or a monitor. This is really helpful for math teachers or someone who has a lot of equations to do. Or perhaps you have an object that is small that if you're going to hold up, people can't really see, but you can put it down on this platform and zoom the camera in very close and people can see on the screen uh, a more detailed picture of, of the item that you want to share. Now, this is an old school thing, but they are still in use. I, I can't believe it, but overhead projectors are still a thing. Uh, basically, this is an, uh, an illuminated light box, and it kind of throws light up into some lenses that, uh, that throw the image onto the wall. Uh, the benefits are they're real simple to make these transparencies that sheet down there, and they're really inexpensive. And it's just a light bulb inside of a box. So they are useful. Uh, people hardly use them anymore. We're all digital. But sometimes you can go into spots and they will have an overhead projector. So how do you prep your visual aid? Let's talk about that for a moment. You want to make sure that you prepare them far in advance. And once you prepare them, practice your speech with them. Uh, you want to make each visual aid very simple and clear so that your listener can grasp their meaning, uh, either just at a, at a glance or after a minimal explanation by you. Uh, if you want to see a good example, look at this. Um, this is an eye, gra uh, you know, this is an eye grabbing uh, visual here. Uh, you can see that the text is simple. It's got a pale background. There's a graphic that is appealing: the smiling mom with her child. The text is black. And something that is really important is noticed in red. It's free vaccinations. These are really good. Uh, think about a, an outdoor ad or a bulletin board post or something you pass by and it just grabs your attention. Um, think about driving on the freeway and you see the billboards that say, don't, don't you, uh, you still doubt that billboards work? Hey, we caught you looking. You know, those kind of things. You don't realize how much you see because your eye is, is, is captured by these images. Make sure that if you use a visual aid, make it simple, clear, but make it something that will catch people's eye. My, my uh, eyes are immediately drawn to the smiling mom and the word free. And then I start getting into it and realize, ah, vaccinations are free. I need to protect my child. So this is appealing. Um, there are two key rules when you make eye grabbers, and here they are. You want to use graphics instead of words whenever possible, okay? Even just a well-placed picture instead of words uh, are much more effective. The second thing is this. If you have to use some words, use only a few. So here's a couple of examples of how these rules are applied. Uh, look at this picture here. If you are going to give a, a speech that's going to urge or persuade your audience to get children interested in, in books at an early age, this photo is all you need. You don't need any words on the screen because you're making the point orally as you show your audience the picture of this child who has her finger in the book. So no words are needed. You see it just visually. Uh, the second thing is this. You need to aim for back row comprehension. 
Look at this poster this guy has. Okay, we know it's a fundraiser. That's one of those little thermometers. But can anybody tell me how much money they're looking to make? See, that is a terrible visual aid for um, a presentation. You simply cannot tell from even the front row, let alone the back row, uh, what the goal is. I'm guessing it's 20000 but I can't really see. Uh, this is the wrong way to do it. Here's the right way to do it. Uh, this is a simple, nice visual with just a, a sparing amount of words. This is the right way because, the, see the guys in the back row? They can see it. What's interesting, I questioned the validity of this uh, photo one time. I had a Chinese student in class, and I asked them, I said, is this indeed the Chinese symbol for poison? And they said, absolutely. So there you go. Uh, that is the Chinese symbol for poison. And you want everyone in the audience to be able to see it. So how are you going to present them during your speech? You've got them all ready. You've got everything you need. How do you present them? You need to make sure that you choose the best time to show your visuals. You want to display a visual aid at the point in your speech when it will have the maximum amount of impact. Uh, perhaps during the introduction, perhaps during the body, even occasionally in the conclusion. But it's a mistake to show a visual before your speech begins. If visual aids are in plain sight before you start, you're kind of depriving your speech of an element of surprise, an element of drama, of freshness. Uh, there are exceptions to this rule, though. Uh, let's say that you are going to be doing a demonstration, and so you may have to have those items out in front of you. But as a general rule, try to keep things hidden until you need them. You want to maximize the impact and the effectiveness of them. If you have a visual aid, you never want to circulate it. Uh, let's say you've got this fossil and it's too small to be clearly seen by the audience. You've seen some people who will pass these things around the room and, and that's a mistake. Here's why. People are going to be totally tuned into the fossil. They're going to be watching it come down the aisle and waiting for their turn. They're going to be looking at it when they have it uh, and they're not going to be listening to you. Um, another thing that could be terrible is what if this is a very priceless thing and, and you drop it? Uh, I remember watching a uh, television show on Tech TV back in the day. Uh, this gentleman was showing this um, this cylindrical record, one of the earliest records ever recorded. I'm talking about years, uh, hundreds of years old, and it was extremely fragile, and he was nervous. And so he passed it off like to these people to check it out, and the guy he passed it off to crumbled it in his hands. It was one of those oh-no moments on television, and what do you do with that? So... People are going to be distracted by it, and they have the opportunity to break something of yours that you probably find very useful and, and, and precious to you. So make sure you don't circulate to visual aids. What do you do then? You put it down and you say after the speech, if anybody would like to see it, you can come up and take a look. And then you can meet them at the table or wherever you have it, and you can talk to them while they look at it, but don't touch it. You want to make sure that your listeners get uh, the maximum benefit from the visuals that you actually bring. And no matter how simple your visual aid is, you should discuss it with your audience. Uh, some speakers have a habit of displaying a visual. They talk about it just for a moment, and then they remove it from you. Uh, not good. Uh, to those speakers, the visual is simple and it's very obvious, but they don't stop to think that the people who are listening to them have never seen this before, and they need some time to analyze and absorb the information as they present it. Uh, if you have, like, say, five posters, right, and you've got them neatly lined up on a chalkboard tray, your listeners are going to scrutinize the fourth poster while you're talking about the first. It's just the way it is. So my suggestion to you is to show one visual at a time. Uh, to keep the eyes and the minds of your listeners focused on your remarks, you want to show a visual, discuss it fully, and then put it away before you display your next one. So have those posters turned backwards and only reveal them as you go. Now there's only really one exception to this rule. If you have a visual aid that can provide a simple uh, undistracting backdrop or kind of evoke a mood. You can you can leave it on display during the speech. Uh, for instance, like if you're going to give uh, a, a speech on flower arranging and you have this beautiful bouquet of flowers, well, that's totally cool. Bring it in uh, and just leave it. It'll set the mood, and that's fine. Now, here's the biggest one, okay? This is the one I want you to just remember. If you don't Remember anything else from this lecture, I want you to realize that 
the visual aid is not your audience. Do not talk to your visual aid. A lot of people will use their visual aid as a crutch. Instead of looking at the uh, the audience, they will be looking at their visual aid the entire time. Uh, so here's the keys. When you introduce uh, your visual aid, look at it for several seconds. This is just long enough to draw your listener's attention toward it and then turn your attention back to the audience. Whenever you want to direct the audience's attention to a particular segment, look at the aid for one or two seconds as you point out the special feature, but then you turn back to your audience and regain your eye contact. And the last thing is this. You want to make sure that you plan for emergencies. Our best laid plans can go awry. And so you want to visit the room that you're going to be presenting in well in advance to make sure you have everything. If you need an extension cord, you need to have one. Uh, with visual aids, remember this, Murphy's Law. If something can go wrong, it's going to go wrong. Uh, what will you do if the TV goes out? What, if, what will you do if the projector burns out? What will you do if you, uh, God forbid, forbid, leave your posters at home and you are about to speak? Um, you know, what if your thumb drive tries to be formatted when you plug it into this particular computer? Do you have a CD with backups? Do you have printouts of your PowerPoint just in case your backup fails? You have to be ready for emergencies. Okay, equipment breakdowns happen, and they sometimes cannot be quick quickly fixed. So. You know, you have to go on, on with the show. If things go crazy, you have to keep going with your speech, even to the best of your ability. And so you're going to have to try to keep uh, your poise and your sense of humor about yourself. And so, uh, yeah, that's uh, that's what I have for you on presenting visual aids. And be careful in those emergency situations. Now, most of you guys in this online class are going to be heading into Life in a Bag speeches. And it is written up for you on the portal uh, if you haven't taken a look into that, well, let me just tell you uh, what I'm expecting. Uh, in this speech, you're going to be introducing yourselves to us. You're going to be telling us about you, and you're going to be using visual aids, specifically three different objects. So your visual aids are going to be three objects and one bag. You can only have three objects in one bag, so that's my limits. All these objects need to fit into your bag unless it's something crazy big, but hopefully you can kind of find a substitute if what you desire is too big to fit in a bag. Just find something else. So these three objects are going to tell us about you. And so you can approach it in several different ways. The first is chronological. So this is me when I'm little. This is me uh, when I was growing up in junior high. And this is me now. It can be topical. You can have three different topics. You can have a metaphorical. These three things are metaphors for this time in my life. You're all going to be, it's all about you. This speech needs to be four to six minutes long. And I'm going to judge that by your recording. Before you actually do your speech and turn in your YouTube link to us, uh, you must turn in an outline via email. Send it to me, brian.manual at lacollege.edu. Uh, and for this speech, a bibliography is not going to be required, but if you choose to bring in some information, I'll note that, and, and that'll look good. But you don't, you don't have to. Uh, so if you have any questions, feel free to shoot me an email, uh, call me at the office, and just let me know uh, whatever I can do for you to clarify that. But I think this is going to be fun. This is a graded assignment, your first graded speech. So have fun with it. Let us know who you are. Use some really cool visual aids to describe to us who you are. And I look forward to seeing what you produce online.